Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Vanguard. Thanks for tuning in today. Oh, please excuse that loud dark, uh, barking from my dog. We're about to be joined by a special guest today, a uh, uh, retired major in the U.S. Army, uh, Danny Thurston. He's also the author of a number of books and uh, contributing editor of antiwar.com. Um, uh, we'll be getting his uh, uh, assistance kind of breaking down, navigating the um, you know, the fact versus fiction, you know, kind of like trying to get away from the mythology of what's going on in Afghanistan as we look at the end of a 20 year war, cost the American taxpayers $2 trillion, cost untold suffering on the individuals in the Middle East, uh, and also on the uh, individuals that were, you know, sent over there to, uh, uh, to, to fight this war. So uh, we'll be getting into, into that with him. And uh, I guess without further ado, let's go ahead and, and get him on the, the stream today. Yeah, thanks so much for joining us today. Major Danny, uh, how's it going? Oh, very good. Thanks for having me. Glad to do this. Yeah. So I guess uh, one thing, just a little bit of a formality. How should we address you? Should we call you Major Thurston? Uh, is it? Uh, do we call you Mister Sir? Uh, I, I want to make sure that we're, uh, uh, you know, uh, being uh, kind to you. We really appreciate your time. Yeah. No, I appreciate that. You know, usually people will like introduce me with my rank just so so they can give me credibility. Because left alone, I'm just like you know Danny from the block. Uh, but you know. Just call me Danny, you know, um, and uh, I appreciate you asking that. But uh, funny thing about like these titles and honorifics, you know, in the military and anywhere else, it's um, usually the folks that are most obsessed with making you call them those things uh, tend to be the guys you don't want to work for and you don't want running <laughs> your war. There's like an inverse relationship between those two, right? Sure, sure. Well, one thing I did notice is uh, it work, actually it's uh, rather uncommon that we see people that are uh, around uh, the same block uh, as us. You mentioned, uh, are you in Kansas right now? Yeah, so uh, I live in Lawrence, Kansas. Uh, I had been stationed at Fort Riley in like 2009 through 12. I did mm -hmm. Afghanistan out of Fort Riley. Um, and then before I taught at West Point, they sent you to grad school for a couple of years. And they sent me to KU, which is in Lawrence, and mm -hmm. uh, went and taught at West Point. But when I came back, I was back to the regular army. I was stationed at Fort Leavenworth. But uh, I liked Lawrence better, so I did that yeah. long commute. And my kids are here, uh, so I, I settled here. Yeah, Gavin and I are just a little bit away down I-70. We record out of Kansas City, so it's good to see somebody that's a kind of local around. We grew up in uh, Johnson County, but that's not what we have you here to talk about. Um, one of the things that I guess I wanted to start with, uh, just to kind of get the ball rolling, and, and something that I, I guess I think we could all use a refresher on, you know, this is a war that's kind of been going on the entirety of Gavin and I's life. Uh, we were both uh, 98 uh, kids, so, you know, very young when this all began. And I'm wondering if you could just kind of remind everybody and walk through, uh, you know, the reason that we first uh, went to Afghanistan. What was the mission that we were uh, uh, trying to accomplish, both uh, the one that was sold to the public and then maybe perhaps if you could illuminate the the kind of the truth underneath uh, of what was actually going on? Um, right. So kind of going in reverse order, but without much detail at first. What we didn't go to Afghanistan for, despite what you read on the pages of the Washington Post, the New York Times and the talking heads on CNN, uh, is for human rights, democracy and women's rights. Because um, to back up, right? Um, well, when did we really go to Afghanistan? Well, in terms of boots on the ground, U.S. uniformed soldiers, the answer is, you know, October of 2001. Uh, post 9-11, go get al-Qaeda, but not really, kind of fail at that, bin Laden gets away. But really, America's story in Afghanistan is a lot older than that and a little bit dirtier and more nefarious. So uh, as early as, you know, 1979, before the Soviet invasion, we found out for some unclassified documents and some admissions, but only only fairly recently, the U.S. was sort of backing this like Islamist inflected, you know, Mujahideen insurgency against the communist government, which was aligned with the Soviet Union. Uh, that was like through the CIA with the money from the United States and money and weapons laundered through and controlled by the coup artist dictator murderer who had you know, killed uh, his former, the guy he overthrew, democratically elected uh, government, Benazir Bhutto's father, actually. Um, and she later became prime minister twice. Anyway, we backed them. And, and one of the things we were trying to do was lure the Soviets into invading so that we could create their Vietnam, right? And it was seen like Rambo 3 from the 80s, like brags about this. Well, the Soviets do intervene and, uh, around Christmas of 79, and then it was game on. It was game on. And, and back then, the Mujahideen, many of whom are very similar to what becomes Taliban, many of whom actually joined the Taliban later, um, we backed the, some of the most reactionary elements because at least they were anti-Soviet. And so the, the CIA had a serious, serious presence, especially in Pakistan. Uh, and we were funneling American money and then the Saudis matched, matched our dollars. 
So oil money, right? Oil money, which was laundered into blood money by a Pakistani dictator, right? No one ever thinks of it that way, but that's what it was, as well as your taxpayer dollars were funding this Mujahideen. Now, I'm not a particular fan of the Soviet Union or a particular fan of invasions in general like the Soviets did, but that's kind of how we get started. Uh, the, the Mujahideen wins. The Russians leave in 88, 89. Uh, problem is the warlords, all these varying factions, I mean, the end of a revolution or a resistance movement or a rebellion is often as messy or messier than the war itself. And the warlords, the different factions that had fought the Soviets, they go to war with each other. And the 1990s are known as the most, that, that's the time that most Afghans who are old enough remember as the most miserable time that they do not want to go back to. And that's important because I'll come back to that at some point later in the show, I'm sure. What they want more than anything is not that, not that chaos. The warlords were like, stop. They set up checkpoints everywhere, making everyday life for the people absolutely miserable. Uh, they were abducting and raping women and abducting and raping boys. They were collecting taxes on the street, basically shaking people down for money. And they were shooting rockets at each other in the middle of big centers, big urban centers like Kabul. It was horrifying. Well, in the end, in response to that chaos, in the sense that there was no law and order and that morals had like, gone the way of the dinosaur. What happens in those situations, a very purist, Islamist, kind of straight up fundamentalist, unknown mullah, like unknown, like, you know, leader of a mosque. I mean, in the area that I later served in, okay, in uh, Zari district of Kandahar province, the actual home, right, founding place of the Taliban, he gathers up a bunch of guys and, and, and he's like, we got to put a stop to this. So they drove or walked or whatever they did up to the, or both up to the nearest checkpoint of the nearest warlord. And they like took it over. They, they shot the guys out of there. They killed some and they ran the rest off. That's how the Taliban formed. And it, it gathered energy. And I'm not trying to make the Taliban the heroes of the story, but I'm telling you why a lot of Afghans in that area and in some other parts of Pashtun, Pashtun eth ethnicity, Afghanistan really do see the Taliban as like, even from their genesis as like liberators, moral liberators, as well as, you know, eventually, uh, national liberators to get us out. That's 94. By 96, they've taken Kabul. And by 2000, they've taken just about all the country except for a sliver of the North, which was ruled by the Northern Alliance. Now they're brutal people and they're pitiless in, in, in a lot of their tactics and in a lot of their social mores. The reason you know that this was never about women's rights, human rights in the, in the first place, that's disingenuous. When people say now, like, oh, uh, but it was always about human rights. Look what we did for human rights. Like, okay, maybe we made some marginal improvements in the areas we controlled. But it was never about that because if it had been, if it had been, then we would have probably invaded Afghanistan when they were executing women via bullets to the back of the head, sometimes stoning and sometimes burial alive uh, in stadiums in the year 1999 and 2000, which is when that peaked. But we didn't. We were like, well, that's their problem. Like, what are we going to do about it? And the answer is, what are we going to do about it? Invading would have been a terrible idea. But in other words, it wasn't about that. But after 9-11, so the political calculus was that we had to do something about this. And probably the strategic one. Like there, there had to be some, I, I agree that there had to be some sort of campaign against bin Laden and Al-Qaeda's network. But we're talking about a few or several hundred people here, not thousands, not a country, right? Terrorism tactic. Al-Qaeda was one group. So instead of declaring Al-Qaeda criminal and we're going to put all the law enforcement and intelligence resources against them, maybe a little bit of military power in the very beginning, uh, we declared war right away. You know, September 14th, the authorization for military forces signed, make it basically saying the president has a blank check to go after anyone that hears the key word. He determines that's the actual language of it, it's still in the books. Anyone he determines to have aided, abetted, or done 9 11. Uh, we invade with, you know, Rangers, special forces, CIA agents, eventually uh, air infantry. And then in about 2002, when the Taliban falls apart pretty quickly, uh, and, and, you know, thrown out by airstrikes and the warlords we worked with that were still existing in the north, we kind of pivot then to like a nation building mission. So now, oh, actually, we had so much success in the beginning that we, we maybe we can change this whole place and make it into like a Jeffersonian democracy. That's the key pivot. And after that, the Afghan war essentially becomes this massive pit. You know, it changes a few times. But in general, we're trying to like pacify the country. What's interesting is the Taliban's really weak from about 2002 to about 2005. They're like in remission, you know, like a, like a cancer or something. And they're waiting it out in like Pakistan or they're doing small attacks here. And there are almost no Americans were getting killed month to month in Afghanistan back then. It was actually really safe. I was in Iraq and we used to be jealous of the guys who got stationed in Afghanistan, which is funny because later it flipped. Um, but the Taliban came back hard. And one of the things I think people don't realize is that America's military occupation, the very presence of the foreign soldiers in the streets is part of what 
fueled the legitimacy and the narrative of the Taliban, which actually ended up empowering them counterproductively. And we couldn't kill as many as we ended up recruiting. So every time we killed a civilian in an airstrike or every time we, you know, we acted poorly in a village or just our presence, we were actually the best recruiting sergeant the Taliban ever had. Since then, they essentially picked up more and more momentum. And um, we pulled most of the soldiers out, even when we had 100,000 there. Like when I was there in 2011 and 12, we really weren't beating them. We were kind of like at a standstill, quagmire, a draw, like a tie. Um, and a tie goes to the, not the runner, a uh, tie goes to the the home team in uh, in, in insurgencies. Yeah. Well, that's, well, that's a great point. If you don't mind if I cut you off real quick, please, it seems please, like the, the Taliban is now, uh, of course, back in power in Afghanistan. Kabul fell quicker than the Biden administration, um, you know, uh, originally thought it would. And there's been this massive, you know, concerted effort from the mainstream media to paint this as a terrible situation for the people of Afghanistan, particularly women, particularly children, et cetera. Uh, and I'm just wondering in your perspective, um, just how bad the, the Taliban, you know, government will be for the people of Afghanistan, uh, if you think it will be as bad as has been portrayed by the media, or if you think it'll be more in line with, you know, what we see in a lot of um, Middle Eastern countries like our allies, Saudi Arabia, which also, you know, represses women and minorities, etc., under the tenets of Islam, just like the Taliban leaders recently said they would under uh, their first press conference. They essentially said, you know, women will have rights, uh, but only under the foundations of the religion of Islam. So that basically sounds like most countries in the Middle East, at least to me. Um, I'm just wondering if you think it's mostly propaganda, um, all of this fear mongering about the Taliban, or if it's actually going to be that bad. That's kind of the key question in a lot of ways. Predictions are difficult in this. Um, I've been wrong before. It is difficult to know what the pure motives of an organization are, especially when that organization is not really a monolith, but like anything else, a conglomeration of human beings with different motives for joining the Taliban. A lot of times in the United States, when we hear from our media, Taliban did this, Taliban did that, you notice it's always kind of like, it's like singular, you know, it's like the Taliban, proper noun. And yes, they have a leadership structure and a rank structure and, and, and all that. But the reality is that the reasons people join the Taliban are a variety of motives, right? So some really are straight up for the religion, like the the Islamist code that they believe is the pure Islam, right? Of course, there's a lot of people who in the Muslim world who are like, that's not Islam, right? Just like Christianity, it's contested. Uh, but some are really into that side of it. Some of them are really kind of like criminals. They're like narco traffickers and like the extortionists for the mafia. I mean, it's, there's like a criminal racketeering element to it. Uh, some of them just like excitement, frankly. Some of them are looking for an identity in the Lebanese Civil War or the Irish Civil War. Look, 18-year-olds who are unemployed and are worried about their masculinity, uh, it really helps if you can collect tolls from 40-year-olds uh, on the road while carrying a Kalashnikov. That's an empowering thing. I mean, I mean, that happens in America's cities to a certain extent. So that's one motive. And then I think one of the most important ones is the nationalist motive. They don't, they're, the, they're in the Taliban because they want to fight the United States occupiers, because that, you know, we took their country. It turns out people don't like to be occupied. How do you know that? Well, uh, try it in Texas. I used to say that to my soldiers. I'd be like, hey, you ever see the, that movie Red Dawn? And they'd be like, yeah, that movie's awesome. And I'd be like, no, you know, the one with Swayze? And they'd be like, what are you talking about? No, the one with the North Koreans. I was like, no, that's not the good one. Old 80s, right? And I'd be like, do you like that movie? And they'd be like, yeah, that's amazing. And I was like, hey, what would you do if the Taliban was in Texas? I was just trying to make them understand the enemy, not like that they wouldn't kill him. And they would say, oh, this is what they would always say. My soldiers from Texas and they're all from Texas, it seems. Right. I'm exaggerating a little bit. There are like regional inflections of who joins the military. And they would go, I wish, I hope the Taliban would invade Texas. The point being like that same thing, we sort of fueled who went in. So now with that being said, the Taliban's a lot of different things. But they're not this. They're not irrational. A lot of times Americans are like, well, they stoned women to death or whatever. So they must, you know, they do crazy things. So that makes them crazy. I would argue, and I think they've shown at every turn, especially essentially that they are in fact rational actors, the leadership of the Taliban. Um, they've got, they're making tactical decisions that are beneficial to their movement, their own power, et cetera. Uh, it does not behoove them necessarily to become international pariahs again. It does not behoove them economically or politically. It does not behoove them to get back in another fight with America. One of the reasons you know they're rational actors is you notice they stopped killing American soldiers when they said they would. They kept that end of the bargain. They didn't keep every single element of it, but either did we. Uh, we broke the deal too, but they did not kill American soldiers. They didn't even really try because they also have to keep their rank and file in line. 
And people don't like being bombed from the sky by the best air force in the world. Now, we won't win wars with that, but they want to avoid some of the casualties and morale breaking that comes with getting the United States back in, even if temporarily. So I think that these moves towards, hey, we're going to give amnesty. Hey, we're going to respect some version of women's rights. I don't think that they're purely uh, you know, real. I don't think that they're purely sincere. And I don't think they're purely disingenuous. If I was a betting man, I'd say it splits the middle. It's kind of a Goldilocks thing. Um, but we won't really know until they've solidified power. And there's so many variables. I do think we should take very seriously that they are the power of Afghanistan, the power in Afghanistan right now, and not paint them with a pejorative brush just because, because yes, you can say you don't like them, but you're still going to have to sort of deal with the reality of them. And I'm not so sure that they're going to like slip right back into burying people live in stadiums. I think they're going to avoid that, even if it's just for tactical reasons. Well, yeah, that's actually that leads to another question that I had for you. Right. And, and obviously, you know, uh, the United States isn't going to, you know, like it, it's just, it seems to me at least. And obviously, you know, correct me if this is wrong, but it seems like that what's really happening in Afghanistan is a tactical shift from the United States exercising its hard militaristic power to using soft power. Right. Like it's geopolitical power. Right. Like so they've frozen all the assets in Afghanistan. So the Taliban doesn't have any money. Uh, I imagine that if the Taliban acts in a way that they're not interested in, they're going to viciously uh, impose sanctions. Uh, try and starve out the civilians, their children, keep them from getting medicine, kind of the same stuff that we do in Yemen, Syria, uh, Iran, etc. right? Uh, basically make it so miserable for the people there uh, that, that they don't support whatever the new government is. Is that something that you foresee happening? And if so, is that why you imagine the Taliban is trying to play ball to keep that from happening, to keep the, the lid on it? Sure. I mean, I think they are I think they are hoping that they can avoid being totally shut out again. I mean, it's hard to be isolated. Sanctions do hurt. Um, I've, I'm of two minds about this. In one sense, I'm okay with kind of just like isolating the Taliban and Afghanistan. Because the truth is, for all this talk about how like Al-Qaeda is going to come back in there, there'll be a new 9-11, that's alarmism. That's alarmism. And, and, and part of the reason is there isn't a whole lot of Al-Qaeda there right now. Even at their the highest, there was a relatively small number, like maybe you know several hundred. 9-11 was mostly concocted. It may have been ordered from Afghanistan at the top, but it was mostly concocted and planned in Hamburg, Germany, in uh, Northern Virginia, and in San Diego and Florida. Terrorism is by its nature has to be secretive they have to slip in it's not overt Ter you know terrorists don't like to gather in big groups because they're easy to bomb right they're, that's the whole idea it's like assassins or something or, or mafioso this idea that a safe haven in afghanistan which is as far away from us as you can be in the world essentially it's like the other side of the globe um is a little bit disingenuous as well and i think it is alarmist and it's exaggerated to keep the war going for people who profit from it professionally or pecuniarily right like in terms of profits um, in my experience, I was in the heartland of the Taliban. Oh, by the way, this is the key. The Taliban is not Al Qaeda. Um, their goals are way less transnational and they always have been. Their goal is to make Afghanistan an Islamist utopia, an Islamist republic, like a, an example for the rest of the Muslim world. They might like to see that spread, but they have never really espoused an ideology of like ISIS, where it's like, we're going to conquer the whole Arab world and then maybe more, or the whole Islamic world and then maybe more. They've never really like had those goals. They're a little more realistic than that. They're a little more rational actors than that, at least the leadership. Another thing about the Taliban is, um, just like most of the elders in the area, they're illiterate. They can't find the United States on a map. And most of them in my area, in the real rural heartland, which again, I mean, I was playing on the Taliban's home turf. I was the Yankees going into Fenway Park. I mean, and it was unbelievable that they expected we were going to have some major success down there. Like we were literally, Taliban country was down there. It was Terry's territory, you know, as we used to say. But um, they didn't even know what year they were born in, half of them. Like they asked them what year they were born in, how old they were. They're like, oh, I was born in the year that the moon was this high and this person was king. And I would like go back and Google and come back and be like, hey, turns out that was pretty good evidence. You're actually 62, you know. But my point is that the idea that they're coming for your kids in Philadelphia, if they take Kabul, is, is a little ridiculous. Sanctions are tough, though, because sanctions don't usually hurt the people you're trying to hurt. Uh, sanctions hurt the people. And there's this theory, and it's been debunked all over and over and over again, even by military people who study this. There's a theory that if you squeeze the people, it may hurt, but it's ultimately for their own good. Americans love telling people what's for their own good. 
that they don't have to suffer. It's kind of our game. That's like our, that's kind of our shtick, right? It's our trademark. And so we're sanctioning these people under the theory that then they'll overthrow their government. So that, yes, we're going to have to hurt and starve some people and cause more like infant death rate to go up and all that. In Iraq, 500,000 children died uh, that wouldn't have otherwise during the sanctions. And they never overthrew Saddam. They never even really tried during that whole period. What we found out, and I bet you psychologists have studied this as well and read some of it, it actually ends up empowering the hardliners in the government. The people kind of rally around the flag. Their anger, even if it should be directed at partially at the top, also is directed at the person actually starving them. It's just directed at the enemy, the external enemy. And the Taliban and the leadership like Saddam is really good at channeling the anger of the people towards the external even more than it actually is. So I think it'll have a lot of negative effects. And from an ethical perspective, I think that we owe the Afghan people a lot, having you know broken their country in many ways. I mean, it was already in a lot of trouble in the civil war. We contributed to that violence. Um, and we made a lot of promises to a lot of people that we didn't keep in terms of those who worked with us. And that's a big story right now. But uh, I do think that probably we're going to hurt the Afghan people even more in our petulance and vengeful sort of desire to punish the Taliban. Problem with that, and the last thing on this, the, the problem with that is like, that's petty in a way, because we lost, because what'll happen, I'm afraid that we're also going to say, look, we want to give humanitarian, wait for this, by the way, I hope I'm wrong, wait for this, this is a prediction. You're going to hear rhetoric from the Biden administration and from the people who were criticizing him and say he should even be harder, saying, look, we'd love to give humanitarian aid to the Afghan people who are suffering, but the Taliban are bad and they're terrorists, and we're not, we can't funnel it through them. They can't be trusted with it. So sorry, we can't do it. And I'm afraid that's what's going to happen. And I feel like the Afghan people are in for just a new round of suffering. And Uncle Sam is not the only person who's doing that. Ooh, he's a big, pretty, he's a pretty big. Yeah, that actually raises an interesting question that I'd love to get your opinion on, which is a lot of people in the wake of Biden's um, withdrawal from Afghanistan, which by the way, I'm interested to hear how much credit you think he deserves for that. Um, a lot of people are saying the Taliban kind of forced them out, uh, you know, because of this deal that trump had actually made you know it wasn't necessarily biden's like sweeping decision to do this it was more like he was his hand was forced um so i'm interested to hear your opinion on that but a lot of people have also said that oh well if the u.s leaves afghanistan will just become a vassal state for the chinese or for russia etc you know if we're not there getting those minerals um then they will uh so what's your response to that i'll start with that second one um I, you know what i say to that let them have it let them have it i mean that we couldn't tame it, right? It wasn't even ours to tame. Um, it's a lot closer to China. You know, it actually borders China, a tiny little portion of it in the Northeast. Um, we never managed to get all those minerals like Cape Hearing about out of the ground. Some people think that was the main reason we went was to get the minerals. And that may have been part of the motivation. There was also pipelines for natural gases if we wanted to run through there and cut the Chinese out and the Russians out. Reality is they, that country was never safe enough. It was They were resisting so much. We never really were able to get them out. So... We couldn't get them. I'd say let the Chinese try. The Chinese are smarter. They'll use economic and diplomatic leverage. They're, they're probably not sending an army in there. They know better. They let us do that. And they laugh at us. They laugh at us for our silly strategic. Just it's We're the Keystone cops out there. And I was one of the Keystone cops, right? So I'm not omitting myself here, right? Um, this, that's ridiculous talk. I, I, don't, I do not like when I hear people say it's like the world is binary. A country is either in our camp or it's in the Russian or the Chinese camp. First of all, those are countries with real people. They're not chess pieces. This isn't a game of risk. I mean, in Washington, they think that way. And to some extent in Moscow and Beijing. But I don't like that talk in the first place. It denies agency and humanity to the Afghan people and everywhere else. The second thing is Afghanistan is like a Trojan horse. I'd, I'd love to, you know, download that onto the Chinese hard drive. Like, let them take a shot at it. it, it it's not going to end well for them either. The thing is, they're smart enough to know not to click on the email, right? So, I mean, they're not really going to get involved in that. As for Biden, I, I'm actually a little impressed that he didn't fold. I'm a little, I, I thought when he came in that he was probably going to reverse Trump's deal a little bit. Keep. I, I thought we were going to see a classic Biden political hedge, you know, like a halfway solution. He's going to like play King Solomon and cut the Afghan baby in half. You know, like if they said he wanted 10, the, the military is like, we want to keep 10,000. He's like, I want zero. He's like, all right, we'll keep five. That's a Biden move, right? No real decisions. But actually, I think he's been wrong on just about every major foreign policy decision of the last what, 40 some years he's been in Senate and public life on Afghanistan. He's been pretty good. I mean, I, I mean, there are aspects of this withdrawal that are problematic. There are aspects of his policy that have been problematic, but he did not fold, not to the generals, not to the pressure on his own establishment of his party, not to the Republicans, not to the media, uh, not to his allies. He wanted out. And he, as vice president, was the only voice in the Obama administration, the only top level primary voice who was saying, don't do this. 
don't do this surge. It won't work. Uh, he's on record of having, having said that. Um, Richard Holbrook wrote it in his diary before he had a heart attack and died. Um, I think Biden does deserve credit here for the, the grit and the persistence to stay with it. And uh, it's strange to hear me say that because so many people think that I like Trump because I've criticized Biden. Of course, that's not true at all. But um, I think it's instructive, though, that that's where it goes oftentimes, the narrative. Yeah, uh, you wrote recently a, a piece uh, in antiwar.com that I just wanted to read a quick excerpt from. Um, uh, it was called Self Delusion is Cruelest of All. Uh, and I just wanted to kind of get your response and, and talk about this a little bit. Uh, you, you wrote that the crucial question that's on everyone's mind seems to be how did this happen? How did the ostensibly and somewhat self styled most powerful military in history fail against? What, when interviewed in uh, Kandahar in 2011, I only slightly sarcastically called farm boys with guns. Of course, the question itself is partially problematic, denying the Taliban and average Afghans agency and arrogantly placing America at the center of a Central Asian conflict. This should be a time for self-reflection and humility. Unfortunately, exceptionalist hegemons are hardly known for their humbleness, and I'm hardly hopeful we'll see much of that virtue or any accountability in the coming days, weeks, months, or years. I fear Americans, and especially their elite leaders, aren't exactly the lesson-learning sorts. Uh, for people who are, are in our audience that are the lesson-learning sorts, um, uh, what, what would be the, the key takeaway that you would have from uh, Afghanistan that you can impose on people as somebody who you know lived it, studied it, you know uh, knows it so intimately. Uh, do you think the allusions or the comparisons to Vietnam and Saigon are helpful? Um, do you think that that helps people understand the level of catastrophe and failure this is? Because we've all pretty much internalized that Vietnam was you know a, a, up until this point our biggest foreign policy blunder, perhaps. You know, every as a historian, like the historian, the academic side of me, historians hate like analogies a lot of times. So they, they don't like when people say this is the new Vietnam and they, they'll always tell you, no, like history is contingent. Every situation is unique. And that's true. That's true. That being said, sometimes analogy can be instructive. And I think that what Biden that I, the thing I least like that Biden said was the day after Kabul fall. So the day before the big press conference. He's, he was asked, um, do you see any like parallels between Saigon and Vietnam and what's happening in Afghanistan? He said, no, none whatsoever. I believe that's pretty much a direct quote. That's absurd. That is, a, th There are so many parallels <laughs> between the two wars and the way they ended. One could, in fact, argue that the collapse was more sudden in Afghanistan because we're talking about days and weeks since the prediction saying it wouldn't happen so fast, most likely. Um, it, whereas it was about, you know, 16 to 18 months after the signing of the Paris peace deal in like January of 73 until April of 75, when things finally collapsed in Vietnam. But the scenes of people hanging off the cargo planes versus the helicopters, I mean, they're, I don't know, I've got eyes, there are parallels, right? They're not exact. They speak different languages and different things happen in those countries, but they're important. Um, as for, you know, the whole like what went wrong factor and what will we learn lessons? I fear we might not learn lessons. And I mean that as a collective. There are Americans who want to. But I mean, the, the collectivity of, of America and like the majority and the people who run things in Washington, they repeat a lot of the same errors. Um, human beings do that. Right. I mean, some of it's in human nature. We do what's familiar. We don't like discomfort especially our own moral and strategic discomfort. We don't like people telling us we're wrong. We made the wrong decision. It was like, we'll try, try again. We'll give it the old college try. It's like, yeah, we already showed you this doesn't work. It's like, yeah, but this time. But also part of it is American exceptionalism. We have the sense, we say things. Okay, first of all, American exceptionalism. Think about the word exceptionalism. If a person, an individual, walks into like a therapist's office and tells the therapist about how exceptional they are and they have a mission in the world and they're the indis they're the indispensable person they're the last best hope for their family and their town you know what we call that clinical narcissism like we you would get maybe on meds or committed but when a country says it's an exceptional where we believe in our exceptionalism it's just called patriotism red-blooded americanism with apple pie and mom I mean, that's insane, but I think it's an it, it's meant to be a little tongue in cheek, but it's, it's an important point. That exceptionalism is part of what got us walking into Afghanistan after everyone else failed there. That was delusion at a criminal level. I'm not sure we'll learn from it. And uh, and it worries me because there are a lot of other mini Afghanistans going on right now. And there's another one coming. And I know that my son, who I'm looking right over there on the wall. And I mean, I'm being a little dramatic here, I suppose, but I really believe this, like, I'm looking at a picture of the day that I got back from Afghanistan that my exo's wife, Amber, took. And there's two pictures above each other. And my son's face is best described as ner nervous and pensive while I'm holding him in my uniform. Most people look at that picture, they look at me in the uniform, and they say, what a cute kid with blonde hair and big cheeks like you. 
What I see is a pensive kid who's nervous because he doesn't really recognize me because I've been gone for a year and I missed this whole third year. He doesn't really know who I know I am. He knows he's supposed to give me a hug. And I think now he that, that kid turns 13 next month. And if we don't learn the lessons and you ask what they are, I think they're pretty simple. Bet big and you might lose big. And if you do, if you do not win, if you do not play, you cannot lose. We shouldn't be doing these things in the first place. Hopeless Crusades. I heard they wrote a book called Don Quixote about them. It's it's this is what American foreign policy is. Avoid this. Do not try to remake societies overseas with at the point of the bayonet. Historians will tell you it almost never works. And I, I think we should only be involved in using our military force when it is a there is a direct and decisive, potentially like even existential threat to the safety of Americans. And I will tell you, not a single, not a single campaign that has been waged since 9-11 has been against a threat like that. It really, really hasn't. It's been exaggerated. It's been inflated. And, and we've taken Americans along for the ride, mostly with fear. Yeah, that's super interesting. And I really um, appreciate what you said there, too, about how you're worried about there being another Afghanistan type situation that unfolds that once again, we don't learn our lessons as an empire. Um, and that uh, is a great segue into my next question, which is a lot of people have pointed out that despite the fact that Biden deserves credit for withdrawing from Afghanistan, uh, we did just raise the Pentagon budget, the military budget. So it's like, what's all that money going to go to now? Are we going to now use the the resources that were spent in Afghanistan, squandered in Afghanistan to now you know, try to invade another country or, or maybe just spread out our imperialist action around the globe a little bit more covertly, a little bit more spread thin. What's your opinion on that? And do you fear that, you know, maybe, sure, we're not going to be in Afghanistan anymore, but those resources will be doled out elsewhere in equally deleterious ways? I hope I'm wrong about this, too. But here's another bit of a prediction. America's military campaign in Afghanistan may end, but American militarism will not. And the, the thing to keep in mind here is it is it is very odd that after America gets out of wars, like we, we're still in most of these wars. We're, we're basically out of Afghanistan now, but we bring the troop numbers down a lot. When I was in Iraq and when I was in Afghanistan, there was about 150,000 troops deployed in those two theaters combined at any one time, which was essentially a, a third of the ground force. I mean, we were really overcommitted. That's why I guys had to do so many tours. It was, it was brutal. I mean, it was like you do a year, you'd come back, you do a year. It was just rough. Um, but we've gone down a lot from that. But the military budget kept increasing. That's peculiar, right? Less fighting and killing, less Americans coming home in, you know, flag, dra flag draped caskets. But we never lowered the military budget. Um, maybe because the military budget is designed to be high and maybe because it profits a select few who live in the suburbs of Northern Virginia and outside of Houston and San Antonio and wherever else they make guns, which is almost everywhere. You know, America used to make cars and ship grain around. They do a little of that now, but the, really the only true industry left in America, all those blue collar jobs are gone, right? And it doesn't matter whether that was good or bad, but you know what we are now? We are really, really good gun runners. It's the number one American. That's, 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 we are, we are the top gun runner in the world by a lot, by a lot. Like we, we, we count for like, you know, whatever it is, like 35% of all of them in the world. And that's like a bunch more, that's a lot more than the second worst, which is Russia. It's funny. How we're, 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 we're the, indispensable nation and like the arsenal of democracy and all that, but we're shipping guns to mostly dictatorships all over the world. The military budget keeps going up because it benefits a select few that it does. Uh, and the problem is there's a lot of trade-offs with that. There's a lot of trade-offs with that. No one ever talks about the opportunity cost. I mean, how many times, what everyone thinks about these issues, we are told all the time, you cannot have universal health care. You cannot have subsidized childcare for uh, single mothers, poor women, or just anyone. Uh, you can't have these things. And I, why, why? There's no money for it. There's no money for it. There's always money for the military budget. The military budget, I, can, I have trouble understanding. It reminds me of when I learned about the universe and how, the, I remember the first time someone told me the universe is always expanding. And I was like, what? I still don't really have my head around that. I'm a reasonably smart guy. To where? In, in where? If, it's, if, if all there is, you know, I still haven't got my head around that. The only thing in American public life that's like that is the Pentagon budget. It always expands. No matter what, no matter if we're in wars, if we're in peace, doesn't matter because it's politically unpopular to cut the military budgets and they say you're taking away from the troops. I don't get that money. I made a decent salary as an officer, but I, nobody was getting rich. And my soldiers, my soldiers, a lot of them died. They died for about thirty or $40,000 a year. Now, the guys who work for Raytheon and the generals who, when they retire, get put on the board of Raytheon, okay, for seven figures, which is more than they make as generals, which is pretty good. They're not particularly interested in cutting the military budget. But you say, but yeah, but... They don't control Congress. Well, 
costs a million dollars to run a congressional campaign now on average. That's what you got to raise just to just to get in the game. Uh, well, guess who is funding the lobbyists and stuff to get them in? Also, they put these factories that build the guns in. If, if you want to build the F-35, right, which is a boondoggle, then what they do is they they build it in like 32 different states. Right. Because no one wants to lose jobs in their state. So they don't want to veto that the budget that funds the F-35 is then 600 jobs in their district to get lost and they lose it. The whole thing is a scheme. Yeah, even Elizabeth Warren was voting for it and basically just tied in behind it because she was like, oh, Raytheon has a lot of jobs in Massachusetts. Right. And and Bernie, too. And Bernie, too. I mean, I love Bernie, but like him, too. So last thing on the, this, though, I think like when I hear that we can't have these things. We, we, we can't have it. And I, people say, well, why, why should I care about the wars? Like, there's no draft. I don't have to go. You know, I'm more issued. In, I'm more interested in kitchen table issues. Right. Social Security and healthcare. And I think what we have to get the American people to understand if we want a real anti-war movement is that war is a kitchen table issue for a lot of reasons. The blowback in your civil liberties, the militarized police, all that, the cultural stuff that comes home, but also your pocketbook. And Americans care about the pocketbook. Everybody does. You got to pay your rent. And that's why I think because of all the trade offs of the trillions of dollars that we threw into these hopeless causes that, you know what, I, if we're going to be a, a mini mall of a country with corporate advertisers running the whole narrative, then I think the DOD, the Department of Defense, needs a new slogan. And I say this all the time. You may even heard me say it. Their slogan should be Department of Defense. This is why you can't have nice things, because it's a large part of the reason we've got to end the militarism, not individual discrete military campaigns. Yeah, uh, yeah, I, I think that's, uh, of course, very true. One of my last follow up question that I had for you, one of the things that I wanted to ask you, you said you were a professor uh, for a, a time at, at West Point. I'm not sure if you're still teaching there. Uh, obviously, you know, West Point has the, a reputation, especially among lefties, right? It's like an officer factory, right? Like where you go to, you know, dream up the next war or whatever uh, happens there. And and uh, obviously, you know, you, you're a, a, a staunch anti-war activist. So I, I wanted to, you know, kind of get your perspective on what it was like teaching in that environment and also ask you, you know, about your students. Uh, has, have you noticed, had you noticed a shift maybe and in, in new students coming up that are more directly challenging U.S. hegemony after it seems like uh, to a lot of people in our generation or me and Gavin's uh, age uh, that these wars were just an abject failure by any metric that you would uh, consider uh, to evaluate them? Yeah, they were a failure by the military's own metrics, which is interesting. You know, like we, we went against our own manuals and by our own ways of measuring, we were losing, right? They just kind of like lied and everyone passed along the lie sort of thing that happened. Um, it was interesting teaching at West Point. You know, uh, first of all, there is like a stereotype and there's some truth in it, right? That it, that it's like an automaton factory. Like we just like create like molded officers that like, you know, are really like straight laced and, you know, wear salmon colored uh polos and boat shoes on the weekend and then they wear their uniform and they kill people during the week like it's just like this is a factory for like you know like white tall dudes with broad shoulders and toxic masculinity you know there's some truth in that but the reality is it's actually really university too and the education is pretty strong and different departments are different ways but i think it would surprise people to know that for example i can speak only for myself in the history department we got one of the best history departments in the country um there's real learning that goes on there and real challenging. I, mean, I was teaching this stuff and I was kind of on the left by far in the department. But I'll tell you, probably about half of the other instructors were presenting. At, we weren't telling them what to think, but presenting these like critical aspects of American history and even which is also current American policy, which is informed by it. And I did see a shift. It was a good school when I went there, right? There were there were there was real thinking professors. Some were some of the teachers are a little more kind of like more on like the military side, just automaton rah rah. But even when I was there, there was I got a great education there. I really did. Um, but the new generation that I taught, a couple of things had changed. It was more diverse in terms of race. It was way more diverse. They almost doubled the number of women. Um, it was about maybe fifteen percent when I was there. It was up around thirty percent, almost a third when I left. So I was there from 01 to 05. I taught there in uh, fourteen to sixteen. The younger generation, while they still were probably a little more conservative and a little more patriotic, I mean, it is West Point, right? Who wants to go there unless you're into like the flag and stuff like that? But I'll tell you, they were a lot more skeptical and th they were more open to the stuff that I was putting out and, and discussing it and debating it than probably even my peers. It, it, like the same stuff in the classroom when I was there. So I do think there's a generational shift, even among people who want to go to West Point. Um, it was a difficult thing, though, to teach there because... I had two things that were kind of running in my head and I'll leave on this uh, or I'll pause here on this. Uh, one, I just got back from Afghanistan pretty soon before that. I was pretty, uh, my mental health was like shaky and I was like struggling with some of that stuff, uh, PTSD stuff and just like guilt and all that. 
And it was really hard for me to look at my students and, and my biggest fear, and I would tell them this every day, every time I semester ended the last day, I would end the class with this, which I mean, that's just what I said, right? It was my floor, I was on the stage. And I would say, the thing that I'm most scared of that like makes me want to vomit in a trash bin is the thought that you, you guys and gals are going to go fight in the same place as I did. Here's the, dir the, the dirty part, <laughs> like life is ugly. They have, I've gotten texts different technology now, right? I've gotten texts and Facebook or me first Facebook messengers from students of mine that I was very close with from Afghanistan, from Syria. Um, I, that is obscene. I mean, you, you gentlemen were born in 98, right? Um, my oldest ex steps on, if that's a thing, but you know, we're still close. He was born in 2002. Currently, this is the, this has never before happened in American history ever right? That someone could be born in a war and then vote in an election. The same war is going on. That is toxic for democracy. And I think it really, really is an indictment of like our political and foreign policy culture. And I don't think we think about it enough. Uh, if we stayed in Afghanistan longer, another thing would happen that's never happened before, which is that a child born after the start of a war would die in that same war. And uh, a child born after 9-11 would die in one of these. It could still happen in Iraq or one of the other theaters. And I'll tell you what, we really better soul search when that happens. And I sure hope it doesn't. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for your insight, Major. It's been an illuminating conversation. I just had one more question for you. Um, and that relates to this article that was published by the Gray Zone in April 16 of 2021. A lot of people, I think, have referenced this in the wake of the withdrawal. And this article was called Biden isn't ending the Afghanistan war. He's privatizing it. Special forces, Pentagon contractors and intelligence operatives will remain. And I think a lot of people are concerned about this in general, the notion that, sure, we might be withdrawing official U.S. troops, but uh, there's going to be a bunch of private mercenaries that remain in the area or the region, you know, controlling the mineral assets assets potentially or um, you know keeping that lookout for China you know that's another reason a lot of people speculated we were there just to keep a eye on China as you mentioned it's on the border um, so what's your opinion on that do you think have, are you by any chance familiar with this article from the gray oh, zone and yeah no I mean I, I've uh, you know I've been on uh, Max Blumenthal and Ben Norton show and I'm very close with um, uh, Gareth Porter right of course and um, I, I think that the Taliban's sweeping level of victory, the speed, scope, and sort of scale of it, uh, may have made that less likely that it would go that way. I mean, I'm not saying we won't try, but I do think that there were reasons to think that if Kabul held and like a, a, the northern part of Afghanistan and the eastern part had held under the Kabul government, that it is likely that our operations there would have shifted to something more surreptitious, right? More clandestine. We would work through CIA agents some air power, mercenaries, right? Contractors, I hate that we call them private military companies, like the PMCs, or, you know, mercenary. I like I like my words plain and precise to a certain extent, right? Uh, let's call us, you know, what it is. And then also proxies, proxies on the ground. We may still work with some of those because some of the areas are probably going to resist Taliban rule and form their own warlords and militias. Another reason that the Taliban, going back to our earlier statement, might not want might want to give amnesty, might not want to be so brutal as they don't want to spark resistance and go back to that chaotic civil war. Because what they're offering the people is, you may not like us, but at least we'll bring order, you know, law and order, like stuff Trump loves, right? It's like, I, I may be ugly, but at least there's no riots when I'm in charge, right? And I think the Taliban has sold themselves and built themselves that way. That's how basically every strong man has risen, right? Um, say that again? Oh, I was just saying that's typically how the strong man rises, right? It's uh, fucked up area and then they can be i am fucked up but at least you're you know you're not getting your shit stolen that's right i mean yeah like you know i mean in, in new york right I grew, I grew up in new york like i i cannot tell you how people who weren't even criminals would defend the mafia constantly and they say yeah but your grand and they weren't totally wrong about this in the practical sense right the, the outcomes were right so your grandmother can walk down the street in, in bensonhurst brooklyn you know uh, and she's not gonna get robbed there now there's some racist stuff involved in that phrasing but that's what they kind of say they offer it's like there's a lot more to it but um, but that is a big part. I I think that the United States is likely to still work through like Pakistan, like back to the 80s where we're having a, it's going to be harder to get boots on the ground there, even like, you know, agents and stuff. But uh, I wouldn't rule out that that's the case. I, I do think that the United States was going to was going to withdraw troops, but maintain presence influence. It will probably still try to do that. but It's going to be a lot harder now um, with the Taliban having kind of swept to power. And I, and I think that's pretty jarring for the people in the national security state who like that kind of like clandestine proxy war. Um, but, but that model, the model of that 
I call it war as an abstraction and war as invisibility. I'm actually working on a book that will be my next solo book, which is going to be, uh, you know, called the new barbarians. Uh, and it's all about the new barbarism of American warfare, but it's like abstract and, and, and the American people don't know about it. And it's mostly proxies and air power. Africa is the real proving ground for that. Keep an eye on Africa. That's where it's happening. We're yeah, trying well, if, out in Africa. Actually, if I know uh, we're coming up on 45 minutes. Are, are you pressed on time? Um, I, I probably have a, uh, probably like three or four. I can say something about Africa. Dubai. Sure. I, I, I meant to ask you about this because I've noticed that uh, Biden has picked up his uh, airstrikes in, in Somalia. I, I just didn't know if you had any uh, mm -hmm. insight in that. And if you think that that's something that you, you obviously we should watch out for. But if you think that's where part of the pivot is going, I feel like so many people have kind of ignored the shadow wars in Africa, not through any fault of their own. The media has covered it poorly. Um, but I, I just wonder if that's the pivot that you th uh, think, because because obviously this is all about China and global hegemony and China's really involved in Africa. Africa. Yeah, Africa's got a lot of mineral resources. It's got the highest, it's got the fastest population growth. Um, and it's seen as like a, like a proxy kind of con a contest, like a contest for Africa, for like the prize of Africa. Um, the, uh, before 9-11, there were 46 American soldiers in the U.S. Army, at least, who were stationed in sub-Saharan Africa, 46. Um, there's about 6,500 that we know about because the Pentagon lies and dissembles about how many are there on 29 enduring and non-enduring bases that we know about. And that was leaked, basically. They don't admit to much. Um, we have definitely pivoted to Africa, uh, but a lot of Americans don't die there. They, they, because they use this new formulation, which Obama really is the one who uh, perfected it, because what he wanted politically was to not have soldiers come home in caskets so much, right? Of course, it feels like a real war and not an abstraction if you're the one under the bomb in Somalia or the one being murdered by the U.S.-backed proxy force in the Western Sahel in Mali or Niger. Americans only hear about Africa like every six months. Every six months, we remember that we were at war in Africa, and we've been at war in Africa since 2001. How do we remember that? Because we're Americans. We are a little obtuse, many of us, and our media feeds us that, is when an American dies. When a soldier gets killed, when those four Green Berets got killed in an ambush in Niger, even Lindsey Graham, who's like the foreign policy expert, like he's really involved in foreign affairs. He's been in the Senate since almost as long as Biden or something. Even he was like, wait, I didn't know we had troops in Niger. And then he like backtracked and we're like, well, we heard you the first time, Lindsey. Like, yeah, come on now. Aren't you a Southern gentleman? Tell the truth. Don't you guys have a code of honor or something that also involves slavery? Anyway, I'm being teasing a little bit on purpose. But the point here is Americans find out that we're doing stuff in Africa when an American dies, which doesn't happen a lot. Most Americans, including most congressmen, I bet you, can't find Niger on a blank map, let alone pronounce it. And I don't know if you've ever seen how Niger is spelled, but it gets awkward fast, okay, if you can't pronounce it. My point here is keep an eye on these kind of wars, the ones that are politically expedient because they, they kind of like power jockey against the Chinese and the Russians and, you know, maybe for resources and economics without getting on the radar of the public because Americans don't know it's happening because Americans aren't dying, right? So it does, it's not in the news. We were in Africa, we said first to stop terrorism from growing, but terrorism ballooned. It got way worse because we went there. Uh, we actually catalyzed it like we did with the uh, Taliban in Afghanistan. And then in 2018, the National Defense Strategy, which is like says what America's military is for. It's like a big document every two years when they update it. For the first time, it, and, and I'll end here, for the first time it pivoted its purpose, its priorities, right? Its lines of effort. Number one, stopped being counterterrorism. And it started being what they call GPC. We love acronyms. Uh, GPC, great power competition. And what that means is the real reason the military is in Africa. They just, I didn't get a memo about it. Just suddenly one day it was the national defense strategy. Um, the American people didn't get a memo either. This was the memo. It was like, hey, you're welcome. This is the new way. Uh, it's to balance China and Russia for influence. So we're fighting over African um, positioning and resources. There's a lot of natural gas there as well as gold and uranium, which is why the French are there for their nuclear program. And uh, we pivoted to that. And I think that is going to be probably one of the new major theaters of this war. And I'm afraid it won't get the attention that an Iraq or Afghanistan did. And just because a lot of Americans aren't dying doesn't mean a lot of Africans aren't. And uh, the war feels really real, really real under those bombs. And uh, that blood is still on our hands, you know, um, the people in Washington, but also us, all of us as a collectivity. I feel that myself. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, our taxpayers are sponsoring this and, you know, we're the ones that are putting the people in Washington that are making this happen. So I think we all, you know, uh, need to seek uh, 
I don't know, uh, uh, retribute. I don't, I don't even know what the fuck the word would be that you, you, we would seek for uh, from our government for this, but uh, forgiveness from the people that we've harmed for certain, if nothing else. Uh, thank you so much for your time today, uh, Major. Uh, it was a real pleasure speaking with you. We'd love to have you back on the show. Uh, look forward to reading your next book when it comes out. Uh, it was a great pleasure talking with you. Oh, thanks so much, and happy to do it anytime. Yeah, thanks so much, Major. And please let everyone know where they can follow you on social medias or where they can find any uh, books you have already written or published. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, uh, at skeptical vet on Twitter. And, uh, if you, if you Google my crazy last name, everything comes up and I have a website, skepticalvet.com. It's got my books. It's got my articles. It's got a silly bio that I wrote this tongue in cheek, but you know, check it out. I actually yeah. liked that bio. You do have a uh, big will hunting energy. I liked that. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I, I, I wonder sometimes if, uh, if that's a positive or a negative, but, uh, but certainly, uh, thanks for having me on and, um, y- you guys ask great questions. I appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Yeah, that was a great conversation. Really, uh, truly illuminating, insightful guest. I'm really glad we had the opportunity to speak with the major. Yeah, and if anybody else is looking for more uh, content uh, where he's featured, uh, he was on the uh, uh, Gray Zone uh, pod uh, with Moderate Rebels with Ben Norton and uh, uh, Max Blumenthal. He was also on On Contact with Chris Hedges. Great conversation there, debunking a lot of the mythology surrounding World War II and whether or not it was truly a great war. Uh, So yeah, just a lot of insight from a guy like that, somebody who's seen it with his own fucking eyes and come back to report the truth to us. Uh, Truly invaluable. Also loved that he was from Lawrence down the street uh, from where we are not really down the road. It's down the street if you live in the Midwest, right? But anyway, uh, shout out to him and thanks for coming on. Uh, it was good chatting with everybody and uh, have a good rest of your day. Yeah, awesome chat. Uh, quick shout out to the patrons before we jump off. Thanks so much to everyone supporting the show on patreon.com slash the Vanguard channel. We'd like to shout out our comrade and Vanguardian level patrons at the beginning and end of all of our live streams. So that link is in the description if you want to join our patron community. It's the first link, patreon.com slash the Vanguard channel. We have to offer our, minif- our, uh, sorry, our members a lot of benefits to make the support worth it. So yeah, thank you so much everyone supporting the show. Really genuinely appreciate it. Uh, really makes the show possible. So thank you everyone. Uh, glad you all enjoyed the stream and thanks for tuning in. But yeah, uh, Everyone have a great rest of your Thursday. Solidarity. Solidarity.